John Elsey writes, Hey Bruce, I was wondering, has the U.S. ever changed presidents during a war or major conflict? I can't remember any president being defeated while we had a major conflict going on. Well, John, thanks. I'll give you the quick answer, and then I'll address an interesting set of possibilities. So, have we swapped horses, defeated an incumbent during war? We have another example in 2012 of a president being re-elected while the war in Afghanistan was going on. Abraham Lincoln said that his victory was due to the fact that voters wouldn't swap horses while crossing streams. He said that to show his humility, that it's not about me, it's just the voters don't like change during a crisis. Of course, we forget that Lincoln made that comment in 1864 when he received the nomination of the Republican Party and not when he was elected, but it's being applied now to elections. In elections in American history, presidents have changed and parties have swapped power during wars. An incumbent president cannot said to have been defeated during what was clearly a war. Was it ever close? It was awfully close at times. 1864, when Lincoln made that remark, McClellan was a strong candidate. Had the Union not prevailed in the Battle of Atlanta, I, th I think the U.S. would have swapped horses. And parties have changed when there were different candidates running for president. But voters have still decided to select a different party. Look at uh, President Obama in 2008. Troops are still in Iraq and Afghanistan, and America switches between the Republican and Democratic Party. It's the reverse when American voters choose Nixon and, over Humphrey and control switches from the Democratic to Republican parties in the middle of Vietnam. Voters have also punished presidents during wars by electing the other party in midterms. 1944 is an example. Not happy with the way the Pacific War is going, other issues. They vote Republicans in. Didn't control the House, but Republicans gained significant amount of seats. 1862, Civil War is going on. Democrats are winning all over the country in those 1862 midterms. 1970, Vietnam is going on. Nixon is president. Democrats have a fairly good midterm. No president, though, is defeated during a major conflict. But Johnson and Truman could be said to have cheated history of an example by not running again, choosing not to run again, in elections where political science would have indicated a defeat. So 1950, with the Korean War going on, Truman steps down, Stevenson gets the Democratic nomination and is defeated. 1968, Vietnam going on, Johnson steps down, Humphrey gets the nomination and is defeated. So, we're not seeing a lot of evidence in history that American voters won't punish an incumbent during war. Perhaps another conflict could shed some light on this issue. In 1856, the United States ship Levant went on a dazzling voyage. From Rio de Janeiro, around the Cape of Good Hope, the tip of South America, to Hong Kong, in order to bolster America's presence in Asia. We were actively trading with China, and we wanted to make sure that trade continued. But these weren't the days when you just sent your aircraft carriers to the Gulf and have them arrive in a few days. Naval diplomacy and conflict took time. Months after she sent, she embarks, delivers the U.S. commissioner to China for transportation to Shanghai. The U.S. were at peace with China, now led by the Qing Emperor. European powers in the United States were seeking to renegotiate commercial treaties they had. This effort was led by the British. They wanted the opening of all of China, all the ports, to their merchants, not just a few of them, and an ambassador in Beijing, legalization of the opium trade, the exemption of imports from tariffs. The Qing government refused, refused to renegotiate. In October 1856, Chinese officials boarded a British-registered ship, the Arrow, and removed 12 Chinese crewmen. British diplomats in Canton demanded the release of them and sought redress. Chinese refused, stating that Arrow was involved in piracy. The British contacted France, Russia, and the United States. Let's form an alliance. Let's fight. Let's open the ports in a forceful way. And the French, who had been angered by the execution of one of their missionaries by the Chinese, joined up. War began with France and Britain against the Qing Emperor. The Second Opium War began. 
The U.S. did not join immediately. Along with Russia, they decided to try to send envoys instead. Sailing off the Chinese coast, USS Portsmouth and the Levant had received news of the beginning of the war. These two sloops of war were tasked with protecting American lives, and they landed a 150-man detachment of Marines and sailors in Canton. After peaceful landing, the Americans occupied the city. A third ship, the U.S. San Jacinto, arrived in Canton's harbor. So, for about a month, the Americans occupied the city. In November, after a brief stay, no military contact, the force withdrew from the city. But during the withdrawal, the American commander, Andrew Foote, paddled out to his ship. And as he did, he passed the two Pearl River forts, which were guarding Canton. The Chinese garrison there fired on the small American boats. The reaction in 1856 is the same as if you fired on a Navy ship today. Oh no, you didn't. Neutral doesn't mean there are no rules. So retaliation was planned. At the same time, the Chinese began reinforcing the forts. The order was given. The commander of the fleet there decided to take such measures as his judgment would dictate even the capture of the forts. There were four forts in the Pearl River guarding the city of Canton. On the 20th of November, crews from these three ships took the first fort by leading an amphibious assault with 300 men. Then they silenced the second fort by turning the cannons from the first fort on it. Once taking the second position, the Chinese launched several counterattacks with some 3,000 Qing army soldiers. In a few more days of intense combat, the U.S. force, with help from the guns from the ships, pushed back the attacking Chinese army, wounding dozens of the attackers, and then captured two more of Pearl River's forts and spiking 176 enemy guns in the process. Chinese casualties, 500 killed and wounded. The Americans had 10 killed and 32 wounded. In four days, all four of the forts were captured. The Levant, close in through most of the action, received the major part of the bombardment, 22 shot holes in her hull and rigging, but she was still seaworthy. After this battle, the U.S. concluded a peace with the Qing Emperor, and with the exception of one other action where a U.S. ship helped with the bombardment of these forts again, U.S. involvement in the Second Opium War was over. Kelly C. Ward asks in the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics site, is this another example of a president losing during wartime? Because the Second Opium War begins under Pierce and it ends under Buchanan, the U.S. 1856 to 1858, and Pierce was defeated for renomination by his own party. Well, it's something to look at. Franklin Pierce, young senator from New Hampshire, received the nomination of his party in 1852 and defeated Winfield Scott, the Whig candidate, became president, was not the most popular president. He did try to get renominated in the Cincinnati Convention of 1856 of the Democratic Party. He entered upon a three way tug of war between Pierce, President, Senator Stephen Douglas, and James Buchanan. In the end of the day, the Kansas Nebraska Act had ripped apart the Northern Democratic Party. James Buchanan had the advantage of being away in the court of St. James, the ambassador to Great Britain, and thus he didn't have to take any position on the domestic issues and the politics of the day. He had a lot of experience, too. He was Secretary of State under Polk, and his forces were more organized at the convention. Pierce lost his party's nod. It was given to Buchanan. Now, the trouble with this, as an example of swapping horses, is that this Cincinnati convention occurred in early summer, and so Pierce was already out well before the fireworks began in Canton in the fall. It could not have been part of the decision not to renominate Pierce. And James Buchanan, running on the same party banner as Pierce, won the general election in 1856. I would also say that the Second Opium War, although it did involve Americans fighting directly with Chinese and did involve American casualties, was not a well-known war in the forefront of American opinion and so was not influencing politics. Kelly C. Ward also notes, the quasi-war with France. Adams missed re-election. The American people replaced him with Jefferson before the conflict was technically ratified by both countries on December 21st, 1801. The quasi-war with France. Okay, well, that's another one to consider. A couple things about that. John Adams did lose the election in 1800. Of that, there's no doubt. But was the country at war? There's a little doubt there. 
The answer is in the name that we call that war now. We were sort of at war. It was a undeclared war. It was a naval war which involved our navy but also privateer ships, the taking of French ships and French privateer ships. It was mostly fought on the seas. At one point, however, a ground force, an army of the United States, was assembled and John Adams as president ordered that George Washington be given the commander-in-chief role. George Washington promptly asked that Alexander Hamilton be his inspector general and, in effect, in charge of the United States Army. Adams didn't like it, but grudgingly accepted. But by the time of Adams' re-election in 1800, Washington was dead. Hamilton, for his part, was no longer commander of the U.S. Army after June 1800. The ground force was largely disbanded, for it was not needed. President Adams began negotiating with France to try to resolve their differences at the time of the election. Indeed, these negotiations were more to blame for the loss of Adams' Federalist support than the war with France itself. That peace would not come until after the election, so John Adams unfortunately missed out on a a good opportunity for a foreign policy victory that might have boosted his election. So, tough call with the quasi-war of France. I still think it hints as to what is the overall truth of this question. U.S. voters will swap horses. They are not bound to vote for the executive in a time of war. Just such a defeat hasn't clearly happened yet. If the war is going well or average, I think it helps the incumbent. If the country's at war, there's more of a focus on the leader. And there's a risk factor with changing stewardship. But if the war is going badly, you see those party switches. You see those midterm results. You see presidents declining to run again. I think American voters will gladly dump an incumbent during a war at some future time. Don Vincent writes, Bruce, I would be very interested to get your take on this. And it is an article from uh, radio commenter Tom Hartman. He wrote an article that the second was mostly designed to protect the slave patrols of the southern states. And thus, the Second Amendment, cherished by so many Americans, is secretly a defense of slavery. The article was widely distributed. Here's his main point. States with Large slave populations feared slave revolts, and they took military steps to ensure those revolts didn't happen. Very often people were asked, with so many uh, black slaves in the South, with their populations so large, particularly in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, there were revolts, but how come there was never a revolt that really took fire, and how come blacks didn't earn their own freedom in that manner? there was this military solution that Hartman's talking about. In Georgia, for example, a generation before the American Revolution, laws were passed in 1755 and 1757 that required all plantation owners or their male white employees to be members of the Georgia militia. And for those armed militia members to make monthly inspections of quarters of all slaves in their states. The law defined which counties had which armed militias and even required armed militia members to keep a keen eye out for slaves who may be planning uprisings. So it wasn't just the responsibility of the individual slave owner, it was the responsibility of the state. Hartman then cites the speech at the Virginia Ratifying Convention for the Constitution where Patrick Henry, a fierce opponent of the Constitution, brings this issue up. His fault with the Constitution was, If the country be invaded, a state may go to war, but cannot suppress slave insurrections under this new constitution. If there should happen to be an insurrection of slaves, the country cannot said to be invaded. They cannot therefore suppress it without the interposition of Congress. In this state, he said, talking about Virginia, there are 230,000 blacks, and there are many more in several other states, but there are few or none in the northern states. Thus, Patrick Henry linking his problem with the Constitution, and the problems with the Constitution would eventually lead to those amendments in the Bill of Rights, linking it directly to fear of insurrection from slaves. Big fan of Tom Hartman and his use of history. I think it's important, and he's one of the people out there who are discussing history in terms of the politics today, but I still think in many cases he's leading history to conclusions rather than letting history lead him. I'm happy to comment on this because it gives me a chance to talk about this rare profession of applied history, applying history to the events of today. It's dangerous, and you have to do it right. I think any of us will have a little bias of some sort, but I also think you can avoid the blatant stuff by not entering historical research 
with a point of view, but letting it lead you a bit. You might always have your point of view, but be willing to be challenged and to change your point of view as you do more and more research. Tom Hartman happens to be looking at history with a left point of view. There are others who will do the same on the right. In my opinion, Henry was an opponent of the Constitution, and you have to look at it this way. He was using the angle that he thought would get Virginians most riled up. Don't pass this Constitution, or you'll be trapped in a slave revolt with no answer but to rely on the North to save you. He was a slave owner, but no proponent. Consistently opposed what he called the abominable practice. Not unlike Jefferson, he's conflicted, even though he was a slave owner and hoped for a day when the practice would be ended. If that were, though, the only part of the problem with Hartman's argument, Henry's lack of devotion to the slavery cause in reality, then it would still be debatable and Hartman still may be right. The weakness would be here. Sure, for the southern states, you might argue that support for an amendment supporting gun rights included the slave patrols and the militia designed to prevent slave insurrections. But you'd have to explain why New Hampshire and New York with just a few slaves and no slave patrols, insisted on the Second Amendment as a condition of their approval of the Constitution. I mean, insisting on a protection for the right to keep and bear arms as a condition of their approval of the Constitution. That's New York and New Hampshire with nothing to do with these type of slave patrols. And then when you, you start to get into 1688 and the Glorious Revolution and the Bill of Rights of William and Mary, and that Englishmen had a express right to keep and bear arms, that there's a lot more to this than just the slavery issue. Paul Sumner writes, Bruce, can you shed some light on claims that Texas is a republic and not really a state in our union, and that it can legally secede at any time? If this is true, what would be required within Texas law to make this happen? What is its likelihood, and what ramifications do you envision? Well, I think people forget when they ask this question is that Texas already did try to leave the Union in 1861 and was brought back in. And they sent in a particular person with tens of thousands of troops. His name was George A. Custer. And he was stationed at Austin after the Civil War. And he expressed the military view when he recommended that the army retain control of Texas until the government was satisfied that a loyal sentiment prevails in at least a majority of the state. When the state of Texas was admitted to the Union, the act of Congress that allowed them in did not allow them to secede. This is something that's just a misunderstanding now and exploited by Texas politicians sometimes. The act of Congress didn't allow them to secede, but allowed them to split into five parts, five different states. This actually was added to the bill admitting Texas in order to calm northern congressmen who were a little worried about adding a new slave state to the Union and wanted at least the possibility that there might be parts of that state could, that could be a new free state. So this language was added in. It has never been acted on. The right to split into five states is actually true of any state. See, California could do it. The only provision in the Constitution is the Congress has to agree, and if you make a new state out of a state that exists, the state has to agree through its legislature. So, so it's nothing really particular to Texas, and it's nothing that anyone's going to act on. With no likelihood, I'm not going to discuss ramifications. It's just too what-iffy. Now, speaking of what-iffy, Stephen Law writes on Twitter, at my hist, that is our Twitter account, by the way. Hope you'll sign up and follow me. Stephen Law writes, McCain would have survived full first term had he won. Quoting me, could it be that the stress of the presidency would have been greater than in the Senate? So he's making a note that I, in discussing age in the presidency, had said that in 2008, I was making the point that this issue of McCain's age is not really the big issue. It should be. He's probably going to survive the four years advanced medical science and the like. So could the stress of the presidency been greater than the Senate? Well, perhaps, but what we know is that McCain's still alive now, and of course we wish him the best, whatever our views on politics are. The stress of the presidency is intense, but, you know, his Senate time isn't without pressures either, I'm sure, and keep in mind that he did recently face a tough primary in his state, which would have brought a lot of stress. But I think also that while the presidency creates a lot of stress, you also have probably the best 
medical care, and observation in the world. I think really the point I want to make is that in 2008, there was a lot of talk. Like, if you elect this person, we're going to end up with uh, Sarah Palin, say, as, as president, because that wasn't, I believe, an accurate statement given medical science. I want to thank you for listening. The Twitter is at my hist. I'm going to be doing another question and answer soon. Follow me, please. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. There you can find a link to the archive with hours and hours of podcasts on lots of political and history topics. Twenty-five ninety-nine. Some of the things I addressed today, for instance, about that five states of Texas, already in the archive. The swapping horses, already in the archive. Lots of other issues. Twenty-five ninety-nine. Hours and hours and hours of podcasts. If you like the program, please tell someone about it. Would love a review on iTunes. Very helpful. If you're listening on Stitcher, thank you very much. Please favorite us or just post a note about us on your blog. Thanks for listening.